Hello students, today we'll be doing uh, the current affairs for 17th of March 2022. The first topic that we'll discuss and the most important topic is Kamikaze drones. Drones are very important from the standpoint of both prelims and mains because drones have completely changed the way wars are fought and won. If you remember, there was this battle between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, around in 2019 and early 2020 and this battle was actually won by Azerbaijan uh, because of the use of drones. This was regarding the territory known as Nagorno-Karabakh and this uh, region uh, is actually dominated by Armenian population though it is a province of Azerbaijan itself and hence Azerbaijan used a lot of drones in order to win decisively against Armenia for the first time. Also, government restores the e-tourist visa. We know that recently the government restored the international flights from March 27th. Now the government has re restored the e-tourist visa also. Also, there is a proposal at the WTO for patent rights on COVID-19 vaccines to be waived. We'll discuss about heat waves. We'll also discuss about the one rank, one pension scheme and why it is in the news. A little bit about the daylight saving time and finally about the Narega scheme. So these three topics are very important while the others are pretty static in nature. Okay, Kamikaze drones, the lethal weapon which is being sent by the US to Ukraine in order to assist Ukrainian soldiers against Russia. Okay, drones called the Kamikaze are a part of the tranche of weapons that are being sent by US to Ukraine to assist their fight against Russia. There are drones that fire missiles and there are drones which are missiles themselves. Okay, now drones like... Uh, like say drones like kamikaze okay these are actually missiles themselves okay while on the other hand you have other drones uh, some of the drones such as uh, hellfire missiles from predator and reaper drones so these particular drones are actually the ones that fire missiles so reaper drones and predator drones both of them are actually launched by usa itself but both of these drones uh, actually fire missiles okay and that is the difference now usa president he had announced recently an 800 million dollar military aid for ukraine through through 800 uh, Stinger missiles. Stinger missiles are anti-aircraft missiles. These were used by the Mujahideen against USSR occupation also. Please remember, these are Stinger missiles. And also he has promised 9,000 anti-tank weapons, 100 tactical drones and a range of small arms including machine guns and grenade launchers. Okay, this new package on its own is going to provide unprecedented assistance to Ukraine. What are Kamikaze drones? Okay, these are also known as switchblade drones and they are small unmanned aircrafts which are packed with explosives that can be flown directly at a tank or a group of troops that are destroyed when it hits the target and explodes. Since we said that kamikaze drones are themselves missiles, these are small missiles, small unmanned aerial vehicles which can directly fly at the tank or at the enemies and it can destroy them. The single-use weapons, these are only usable ones, are cheaper, very cheap, as compared to both the Reaper and the Predator zones or drones, and come in two sizes, Switchblade 300, it is the smaller one, while the Switchblade 600 is the bigger one. Now, the Switchblade uh, 300, it weighs about 5 pounds and flies up to 15 minutes at a time, and is designed to be carried in a small backpack also, while the Switchblade 600, in comparison, it weighs about 50 pounds. And it flies for up to 40 minutes and it is known as a loitering missile that can target armored vehicles. So that is the difference. In terms of weight, in terms of uh, ability to carry enough uh, material ammunition and also in terms of the range of flight for 40 minutes. You know, Not. also, uh, okay. Uh, while the Switchblade 300 can target small infantry units, this can target armored vehicles also. The drones have the capability of going past traditional defenses to strike its targets 
and also cost a fraction of what the larger counterparts do. Why are they able to evade the radar? Because these drones, they fly at very low altitude. Okay, and because they fly at a low altitude, it is difficult for radars to detect them. They just weigh, weigh around five and a half pounds. We had discussed about it. It weighs only about five pounds, including its small warhead, the switchblade. Uh, can be taken into battle in a backpack and fly up to seven miles to hit a target. So once you activate this uh, small unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, it's like this narrow, okay? Uh, and then as soon as you activate it, its uh, spikes come out, okay? And then it starts operating, it starts flying, and then it goes and bombs the other uh, enemy territory. They are called switchblade because their blade-like wings spring out on launch. The drone is made by a private company, Aero Environment, and has been in the arsenal of US commandos since it was sent to Afghanistan in 2010. The switchblade has a feature that allows the operator to adjust the blast radius, so it can kill the driver of a vehicle but not the passenger, for example. Look at this, even the radius, the blast radius is controllable, and also the weapon can be waved off up to two seconds before impact. This does not happen in the case of Predator drones. Uh, like say for example recently when the Afghanistan evacuation was happening uh, you know towards the end the USA actually launched a predator drone to uh, bomb one of the ISIS targets and what happened was that after the drone was launched the drone could not be recalled because it was too late to recall it and because of that some uh, 10 you know uh, victims died and out of that seven of them were children because this could not be recalled seven were children however in this case you know uh, in this case the weapon can be waved off up to two seconds before impact the switchblade also has cameras that show the target seconds before the impact and the drone cruises at 63 miles per hour and provides operators with real-time video downlinks for centralized view of the area of operation comparison between the kamikaze drones and the other drones we have Hellfire missiles, which rain, which are, uh, you know, shot from Predator and Reaper zones to hit terrorist targets. However, this drone, drone war, it is very different now because Kamikaze's cost only $6,000, while the Predator's cost about $150,000. The small lethal drones are difficult to detect on radar and can even be programmed to hit targets without human intervention based on facial recognition. The Kamikaze's can act by themselves. They do not need humans to operate them, unlike the bigger drones. Now we will discuss the second topic, which is government restores e-tourist visa for 156 countries. Okay, we know that recently the government has approved international flights to start traveling from March 27th onwards. So from the same date, the government has said that e-tourist visa facility will also be applicable, available for 156 countries. Now what is an e-visa? In a normal visa, you do everything in a physical manner. Whereas in the case of e-visa, you do everything in an electronic manner. You apply for it online, you pay the e-visa fee online, then you receive the electronic travel authorization, uh, which is needed in order to fly out online. And then you fly over to India, you print that ETA and present it at the immigration, which is where you enter into India. Okay, and over there you get the e-visa stamp. So everything is done in an e-manner. You don't need to visit the Indian embassy even over there. Okay, the government, after it announced international flights to resume, now it has restored the electronic uh, tourist visa facility for 156 countries. The, uh, we are discussing over here about the international flights resumption. Now the government had announced that international flights will resume fully from March 27th onwards, which is 20, which is two years since it was shut, shut down <laughs> okay now despite the flights being shut down from march 23rd 2000 and uh, though uh, you know the flights were actually shut down uh, and uh, the international flights were banned on march 23rd 2021 after four months which means from uh, after four months after March, which is around uh, June-July time period, the government started entering into bilateral air bubble agreements with various countries, such as France, Germany, US, uh, in order to uh, 
in order to allow people to travel between countries because these countries were not okay with uh, india carrying out the vande bharat flights they were not okay with india carrying out its own repatriation of its citizens and hence india had to enter into air bubble agreements with these countries in order to uh, let flights travel commercial flights travel and india has agreements with 36 such countries what does e visa e visa facility like what we had said uh e visa facility we had discussed everything happens in an online manner okay now according to the latest rule change uh e visa will be available uh, tourist e visa will be available for 156 countries but it should be remembered that all land and river and borders including the athari waga border will remain shut except for those with special permission the ministry also said that instructions will not be applicable to afghanistan nationals who will continue to be governed by the emergency ex miscellaneous visa and not the e visa currently valid e tourist visa issued for 5 years which was suspended since march 2020 shall stand restored to nationals of 156 eligible countries with immediate effect uh, and these people will also be available uh, eligible for fresh e tourist visa the order said valid uh, tourist visa which is paper visa with a validity of 5 years issued to foreign nationals of all countries shall be restored the long duration which is the 10 year visa for citizens of usa and japan issued before march 2020 has also been restored only for citizens of us and japan they get a 10 year visa okay while the citizens of other countries they get visa only with a validity of 5 years the ministry said foreign nationals who have tourist e tourist visas may enter india only through designated sea immigration checkpoints or international airports not through the land or river in borders okay and it's also not applicable to afghanistan uh, citizens what is e visa we had spoken about it earlier once uh, you know the e visa is approved the person receives an email authorizing him or her to travel to india on arrival the visitor has to present the authorization to the immigration authorities who will stamp the entry into the country like what we had discussed e visa is of five different types e tourist visa e business visa e medical visa e conference visa e medical attendant visa and when it comes to duration of stay stay e tourist and e business visa can stay for a maximum period of up to 1 year with multiple entry subjected to stay stipulations on e tourist visa continuous stay during each visit shall not exceed 90 days it cannot be more for it cannot be for more than 90 days in a continuous manner in case of nationals of all countries who are eligible for grant of e visa except nationals of usa uk canada and japan okay for these people they can stay continuously for 180 days which means they can stay continuously for around 6 months okay uh also on e business visa continuous stay from any country shall not exceed 180 days which means again 6 months now moving on patent rights on covid-19 jabs may be waived see all these are the different types of iprs and over here we are discussing about one of these iprs which is patents patents is nothing but it protects the functional or ornamental features such as the swipe feature of an iphone trademarks are nothing but uh, these are brands such as the tick mark for nike that is a trademark copyright this is usually provided on music on uh, videos etc trade secret this protects the information regarding you know any process such as making a uh, coca cola you know anything making a bomb you know the the secrets that in are involved in the production of that uh, product itself intellectual property rights held by international pharmaceutical companies on covid-19 vaccines may be relaxed for up to 5 years according to a proposal by european union against a backdrop of festering 2 year old dispute at the world trade organization involving usa india south africa and the eu this reprieve will however not apply to covid-19 drugs and diagnostic devices Though the EU proposed a discussion on this in the next six months, and also rebuffed India's original demand for a waiver on intellectual property restrictions on COVID therapeutics, thus COVID therapeutics are not involved. 
and even the drugs used to treat covid are not involved nor are the devices involved so the only things that are involved are the covid vaccines this waiver will allow pharmaceutical companies in developing countries not only to make but also export vaccines without explicit permission from patent holders currently many developing countries including india already have a system of compulsory licensing okay now what is compulsory licensing okay under certain situations it allows compulsory licensing allows the uh, allows the state to authorize misusing of uh, patents i mean misusing is probably not the right word they can replicate those patents in a legal manner and that is compulsory licensing and what are these conditions if at all the vaccine cost is too high if at all the medicine cost is too high if at all there is not enough supply not enough supply of the medicine from outside or in these kinds of conditions compulsory licensing can be given to one company which ends up producing that particular drug or vaccine or anything in order to save lives it uh, permits the government to authorize production of a drug or vaccine irrespective of whether it is protected by patents a clause in the text said these waivers would apply to developing countries that have not exported to more than 10% of the covid-19 vaccine doses in 2021 okay so india might not fall under the category of those countries which can take advantage of uh, this lapse in uh, patent okay now we will discuss the indian patent act over here now what is patent you have to understand that like what we discussed patent it protects a particular property okay uh now the and the other types of uh, iprs are uh, copyrights industrial property uh, geographical indications okay all of them are also iprs along with the ones that we discussed above now what is the importance of iprs iprs actually encourage innovation okay they encourage economic growth they safeguard the rights of the creators they also promote ease of doing business thereby all those companies which are innovating they are researching they can monetize their products it also facilitates the transfer of technology in case there are mous or partnerships later on okay now the indian patents act uh it's okay the patents act of 1970 it is the uh it is the overarching legislation that controls patents in india patents act of 1970 now this patent tax patents act has been modified several times uh, the last time it was modified was in 2005 currently uh, the product patent has been extended to sectors such as food drugs chemicals and microorganisms which means that all these products within these uh, categories okay can be patented okay some of the features of this indian patent act are that you have both product as well as process patent you can go for either patenting your product or you can also patent your process the term of patent is for 20 years patent examination can be conducted on request you can request uh, the authorizing person to examine your product for providing your patent there is a fast track mechanism there is also pre grant and post grant opposition which means that you can dispute that patent protection of biodiversity and traditional knowledge publication of applications after 18 months of date of filing of patent application these are uh, the several features that you have for the indian patent act okay one of the most important aspects of the indian patent act is compulsory licensing of the patent subjected to fulfillment of certain conditions like what we had discussed also the section 3 this is one of the most important sections of the patents act it stipulates that mere discovery of a new form of known substance which does not result in enhancement of any efficacy unless such known process results in the new product or employs at least one new reactant is not patentable hence 
द इंडियन पेटेंट एक्ट डज नॉट अलाउ एवर ग्रीनिंग ऑफ प्रोडक्ट्स अर्लियर वॉट वॉज हैपनिंग वॉज दैट ऑल दीज फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनीज दे आर मेकिंग स्मॉल चेंजेस स्मॉल ट्वीक्स एंड देन विद दैट दे आर गोइंग फॉर रीपेटेंटिंग दिस वे वॉट हैपन्स यू नो बी ऑन द ट्वेंटी इयर्स अगेन द फार्मा कंपनी विल मेक अ स्मॉल चेंज इट विल रिटेन इट फॉर अनदर ट्वेंटी इयर्स दिस वे दे आर नेवर लूजिंग दर पेटेंट्स हीट वेव्स some of the other okay one more thing some of the other uh, conventions which are there in order to protect uh, iprs the most important one is trade related to intellectual property rights under the wto the second one is the budapest treaty on international recognition of deposit of microorganisms for the purpose of patent procedure so the budapest treaty is one more okay the other one is the paris convention on protection of Ind- industrial property so the paris convention okay and then the convention which established world intellectual property organization okay and then apart from that we have also the bern convention so all these conventions are responsible for protection of one ipr or the other let it be let it be patents let it be uh, industrial secrets trade secrets let it be anything okay moving on heat waves the reason why heat waves are in use is because the konkan region including mumbai has been experiencing high number of heat waves with the temperature touching the 40 degree mark the ongoing heat wave in konkan including mumbai is because of the direct influence of the prevailing heat wave in kutch region the hot and dry winds from northwest india are reaching parts of konkan in addition the slow movement of sea breeze along the maharashtra coast and the overall clear sky conditions have resulted in very strong heat waves what is a heat wave the heat wave is considered when the maximum temperature of a station reaches at least 40 degrees for plains and at least 30 degrees for hilly regions this is according to imd if the normal maximum temperature of a station is less than or equal to 40 degrees celsius you know if normally the maximum temperature of that station itself is lesser than 40 degrees celsius in that particular station it can be declared as a heat wave when there is a sudden increase of around 5 to 6 degrees from the normal temperature and if there is an increase of 7 degrees or more then it is known as a severe heat wave okay if the normal heat, uh, maximum temperature of the station is more than 40 degrees okay if the normal temperature itself is more than 40 degrees then an increase of around 4 to 5 degrees is enough to be called as a heat wave while an increase of 6 degrees will be known as a severe heat wave okay additionally whenever the temperature is more than 45 degrees celsius irrespective of what the normal maximum temperature is a heat wave can be declared in case the maximum actual maximum temperature that exists currently is more than 45 degrees celsius now why is india having more heat waves it is because of increased number of concrete what does concrete do okay the concrete it basically it absorbs heat and there is a lack of tree cover tree cover ensures due to transpiration that the place cools down because of these things it gets warm urban heat island effect because of additional concrete concrete buildings concrete jungles you have urban heat island effect which results in localized heating okay also because of climate change there has been an average 0.8 degrees increase in the temperature in the last 100 years okay there are more higher daily peak temperatures and more intense heat waves which are becoming more frequent due to climate change and other uh, reasons moving on one rank one pension scheme for the armed forces recently the supreme court has actually given a verdict saying that the government was completely within its rights and the one rank one pension scheme is not unconstitutional uh the supreme court upheld the center's one rank one pension scheme for the armed forces now what is one rank one pension scheme it means the payment of same pension to military officers for the same rank for the same length of service irrespective of the date of retirement so all those military officers despite 
them having retired in 1980 or in 2018 if they are retiring at the same rank and if they have served for the same number of years then they'll be receiving the same amount of pension the center had prom- promised that pensions of all pensioners would be protected the scheme mandated a refixation of pension every 5 years okay so every 5 years this pension is uh, refixed and it is varied before this one rank one pension scheme uh, ex servicemen used to get pensions as per the pay commission's recommendations uh, as per the pay commission's recommendations as as and when they had retired it was based on the date of retirement okay but now it is shifted from the date of retirement to this okay also um, all those armed forces personnel who had retired till the till 2014 are currently covered under this one rank one pension scheme and this uh, scheme was implemented based on the recommendations of the bhagat singh koshiyari committee please remember this this koshiyari committee was Uh, i mean mr koshiyari is the current governor of maharashtra and on the basis of this committee's recommendations uh the scheme was launched arguments in favor of one rank one pension scheme we had discussed this earlier it's a very straightforward argument uh because of the risk under which these officers are working and because of their low salaries and because of the disparity between past and present pen- pensioners and because of the comfort that civil servants are given all of these reasons one rank one pension is supported okay while uh in opposition to the one rank one pension scheme we have points such as uh, the pension scheme it adds around 10000 crores every year also one rank one pension scheme is being implemented retrospectively from 2014 and there are huge arrears for it armed forces personnel are already provided separate military service pay field area allowance counter insurgency allowance and they get definitely other benefits such as army hospitals army schools etc so why do we need the one rank one pension scheme okay we have we don't have an idea okay similar uh, demands can be made by capf bsf crpf because they are also working under similarly tough situations and hence they can also ask for the same daylight saving time the united states senate on march 15th unanimously passed a law making daylight savings time permanent scrapping the biannual practice of putting the clocks forward and back coinciding with the arrival and departure of winter so what happens in the us is that in september okay the clocks the clocks are actually forwarded by 1 hour and in the starting of march the clocks are clocks are rewinded by 1 hour this this 1 hour when they are rewinded by 1 hour it increases this 1 hour of daylight time and this is known as the daylight saving time if the legislation Sun- sunshine protection act passes in the house of representatives as well and is signed into law by president joe biden it will come into effect on november 2023 What is this daylight saving time? This is also known as summer time and it is like what we had discussed. It is a system of uniformly advancing clocks so as to extend daylight hours during conventional waking time in the summer months. And the practice was suggested by Mr. Benjamin Franklin. And many countries in the northern hemisphere they set their clocks 1 hour ahead in late March. Okay. Now what is the use of this daylight saving time? do you realize if at all there is more daylight there will be lesser use of energy there will be lesser tube lights okay and uh, all of that so it will result in saving of a lot of energy it helps in increasing the focus on energy efficiency due to climate change because of over consumption of energy makes dsc relevant dst relevant dst is thus an environmentally sustainable concept to ensure that clocks show a later sunrise and a later sunset in effect ensure a longer evening day time you get more evening uh, time you get more leisure time because the sun is up till around 7 o'clock over here and hence you have more free time to play in the evening or spend a uh, good leisurely time 
DST also results in completion of routine work an hour earlier. Okay. Opposition to DST. Who oppose it? You know, farmers oppose it. Farmers oppose it because grain is harvested after the due evaporates. But if you are, you know, if you are rolling back the time, uh, the dew wouldn't have evaporated. And so when field hands, which means normal farmers, they arrive and they leave earlier, this uh, labor is less valuable because uh, the grain is not very good to harvest at that point of time. It is not the best quality. Also, dairy farmers are affected because cows also have some sort of a circadian rhythm, like how humans have a specific time to wake up at, a specific time to sleep at. Cows also have a circadian rhythm. And delivering milk early, it disrupts their systems. Okay, it can also lead to increased number of workplace injuries due to excess due to sleepiness. It can also result in lesser labor and work productivity because of that same sleepiness. People are tired and lethargic due to reduction in sleep because you are pulling back uh, the clock. Okay, next, Narega scheme. Why is it news? According to a parliamentary standing committee, report submitted to the Lok Sabha, various issues are hampering the MG Narega scheme. Now, what are the issues which are disrupting this uh, Narega scheme? Some of the issues are fake job cards, widespread corruption, late uploading of master rolls, huge pending payments for wages and materials, and insufficient funding. All these issues are disrupting Narega. Genuine laborers are not getting their dues, while money keeps changing hands due to collusion of unscrupulous elements surrounding the implementation of the scheme at the ground level. This is what the Parliamentary Standing Committee is suggesting. Hence, you can directly quote this. Okay. Uh, regarding the ineffectiveness of MG Narega. What does the committee say? It says that during their study visits, it had shown that Rosgar Sevaks, who are normal people, who are laborers, uh, I mean, who are people who are getting work under MG Narega, they are in the habit of filling up the muster at the starting of the month. And they later, they go to the block only once in a week for online uploading of the muster rolls. And if the muster roll is not updated and uploaded within the stipulated time, it, it could not be backdated. And this results in a loss of payment. And over here, despite the laborer doing his entire work, because he is not going in time and he is not ensuring that the uploading of the muster roll happens accordingly, he will be losing his uh, payment. Or someone else is probably going to take his payment. That is the reason why the Parliamentary Standing Committee says that there are fake job cards. There is widespread corruption. There is late uploading of the muster rolls. And there is a huge amount of pending payment for wages and materials. And there is insufficient funding. Pending wages amounted to around 4,000 crores. While material, wage, while material payments are pending up to 9,000 crores. So there is a huge payment backlog of around 13,000 crores. And despite this uh, backlog, the panel found that the budget estimates for 2022-23 were reduced from 78,000 crores, which were sought by the Rural Departmental Ministry, to around 73,000 crores. Despite so much of pending wages, you know, the government is not willing to give the 78,000 crores, which was sought by the uh, Department of I mean, the Department of Rural Development. Rather, it is only giving it 73,000 crores, which might not even be enough. Now, the various features of MG Narega are actually given over here. MG Narega, it provides a legal guarantee for wage employment. Okay. And it provides a legal guarantee for 100 days of wage employment to every household in the rural areas of the country. Okay. Now, in case the employment has not been provided, in case, uh, if the employment has not been provided, then unemployment allowance has to be given to the person. Unemployment allowance is given to the person. Okay. Now, the other thing is that out of all the workers who are benefited under the scheme, the percentage of scheduled caste workers has consistently been about 20% and ST workers has been about 17% which is one of the biggest benefits of the scheme. Also, like what I said, the unemployment allowance has to be paid if the government is unable to provide jobs within 15 days of the application. And the social audit is mandatory under the MG Narega. 
okay audit is conducted of the muster rolls social audit is done at the panchayat level itself and also the wages which are given uh, under mc narega are based upon the cpi for agricultural laborers this is released by the labor ministry okay please go through the other points which are there over here especially this particular point which says that the choice of works done through the village level plans and 50% or more of the work is to be executed by the panchayati raj institutions okay around 50% of the work has to be executed by the panchayati raj institutions and whatever are the works being done more than 50% of it has to be decided by the panchayati raj okay thank you